Hi, I'm David Hester, and welcome back to the Alt P. Brach approach number one. And today I'm going to talk about rule number one. Primary sources are required. All right, what does this mean? Well, first it means that we have to recognize that any source you're typically going to turn to, P. Brock Society, Kilberry, Vinius's Boryag, is modern, derivative, maybe reflection of, of the evolution of style up to this point, but all of them derive their information from earlier sources. Many of them claim to have oral source tradition in their background. But when it comes to the Peabrock Society and the Kilbury collection, for example, we know from the Kilbury notes exactly what Archibald Campbell set about to do, which was to take the variants that existed in the manuscripts and bring them together to create a definitive standard setting of any given piece. Um, that's fine, and that's great, but it's also a heavy editorial hand and a heavy editorial decision made by the music committee at the time. So you need to become aware of how derivative these modern sources are. You should also be aware of the fact that sources like Thomason relied upon these manuscripts, Glenn did as well, William Ross did. In fact, the very interesting thing is that historically speaking, we have about 313, maybe 314, there's been some consolidation, individual pieces from up to 1850, after which only 30 or so new Pibrach were written. That's it, 30. Then came John Grant, who himself wrote about 70. And then later, Donald McLeod wrote more, and then so on and so forth. But as you can tell, setting aside John Grant, anything else that had been collected was a collection of materials already extant, except for these 30. So getting back to the original sources helps you transport yourself through the scores and settings, unlayer all of those accretions, interpretive and editorial accretions, and take a look for yourself what the original source scores looked like that were then edited and typeset and put into the public domain. So that's one of the things it means. The second thing it means, when you get to the primary sources, these earliest manuscripts and scores, um, you can start noticing some very interesting things, namely the differences in style that exist between um, key authors or families, as I'd like to call them, of um, performance. McDonald style performances as reflected, for example, in um, the Henny McCausland collection, in Donald McDonald's books, and his manuscripts, that style is different. Peter Reed's may or may, may be closely associated with it. Um, that style is different than what Angus Mackay did. Very different from what Angus Mackay did. Colin Campbell has another whole core. Um, Gesto comes from the Cantorac of McCrimmon. Um, Contrasting and comparing, we see some interesting things about styles with respect to things like cadences and krahanin, which I'll teach you about more, but also, very intriguingly, that some performers left out 
certain variation cycles. Some performers would mix up and change the order of these variation cycles. Um, so that kind of gives you a sense of the interpretive and improvisational quality that a Pibroch player had to have as a musician to address an immediate audience and that audience's expectations. What it also means by getting back to these original sources and scores is that you respect them when you read them. You don't try to force them into the style that we play today. Yori and I tried that over a couple of years, and it was just hard to do. We would read the score, and then we listen to the way it's played, and they wouldn't match up. So then when we decided, you know, I'm going to play this in competition, we look at how it was written and how it's played and say, it just doesn't work. It's not working. The scores reflected something different than what we play today. And if you were to allow the scores to speak to you, don't read into them, read out from them. If you were allowed yourself to do that, you would begin to see some of that glimpse of that Gaelic song tradition stuff I had mentioned, just a glimpse of it. Reading these scores, what they have, not literally, but as a musician, respecting what's on there, you hear new things in these, um, in these songs. You hear new things. Um, Finally, what does it mean to get back to the primary sources? Well, it means, for example, when you go to play a modern Pibroch, like by Bruce Gandy, or Donald McLeod, or John McClellan, or Stephen Knox, when you go to play them, get back to their sources, pay them for it, and play what you see there. I can tell you they would all be interested to see what interpretation you bring. Listening to what Donald McLeod played the Field of Gold like is really interesting. But he would also tell you, go find your own music in there. Go find it for yourself. Don't mimic me. So John Wilson says that Don McLeod taught him, Laddie, go find the music for yourself. You are the interpreter, but respect what you read pay the composer and bring your insight into it, but don't revert to secondary and derivative sources until you are quite familiar with what the primary has to teach you. Because from these primary scores, you will make a more informed interpretation of the later scores published by the Peabrock Society and Kilbury, etc. and College of Piping and so on. Okay? That's what I mean. Primary sources are absolutely required for you to become a better musician.